شهر رمضان الذي ينزل فيه القرآن then he says هدل للناس this part of the ayah is a slap in the face he says Quran is guidance for all people this ayah is not just to the Muslims it's also to the Jewish community of Medina they believe that when wahi comes it comes for who? just themselves it's just themselves Allah says no you are not going to this time this wahi is not just for you it is for all people, Hudan lil Nas. He didn't even say Hudan lil Arab, Hudan li Bani Israel, Hudan li Bani Ismail, Hudan li Bani Ibrahim. No, 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 no. Hudan lil Nas. This guidance for all people. This is one of the most beautiful things about our religion, folks. It is one of the most beautiful things about our religion. I don't care if you go into a masjid in America or Australia or the Khalij or Pakistan, if there are multiple nationalities multiple nationalities standing in one row you don't make a distinction the rich people should be in the first row middle class should be in the second row the janitor should be in the third row no nope. no nope. everybody stands in the same row and it could be that the boss and the worker are standing together and it could be that the worker is in the first row and the boss is in the last row that could be too it could be that the guy who works for you is leading prayer and you're praying behind him that could be too Allah made this guidance for all people. You know what that means? He made all human beings equal. Just by Quran, by the institution of Salat. We cannot be racist because we have Salat. We cannot be supremacist. We cannot think my nation is better than your nation. My nationality is better than your nationality. My language is better than your language. My skin color is better than your skin color. My village is better than your village. We can't do it. And you know when we are reminded that we can't do that? When we stand together in Salat. When Bilal radiallahu anhu is standing next to Uthman radiallahu anhu, we are reminded that we're equal. This is hudan lil nas. That's what that means. You know why I'm highlighting that? Because I notice it in Muslims. I notice asabiyah in Muslims. I notice Muslims make fun of other nationalities, look down on them, talk bad about them, talk bad about people that speak a different language. The, Ar the, the Arabi makes fun of the non-Arabi. The Bangladeshi makes fun of the Pakistani. The Pakistani makes fun of the Indian. The Filipino makes fun of the Malaysian. What's going on here? Don't we make Salat? Don't we make Salat? Because if that's what our, if we're not learning from our Salat, if we're not learning from this Quran, then we're just, it's like, I, I tell you, we're just a shell. You know, if you have a shell and you don't have any egg inside, that's what our Islam is sometimes. It's just, a, you look like Muslim, you say the words that Muslims say, but inside your heart, there's no, there's no love for your deen. Every one of us here that are sitting in this audience, so many different countries are sitting in this audience right now. It's such an international gathering right here. This is a United Nations meeting right now. You know? Let me tell you, I don't know your name. Some of, some of you know my name, I don't know your name. But you know what? We have a relationship with each other that is thicker than blood. It is thicker than blood just because of La ilaha illallah. Just because of that. This Qur'an binds us together. And this was told to the Jews. You know why? Because the Jews believed they were special. Everybody else is second class. We're first class. Everybody else is Gentiles. We're the chosen nation. Allah says anybody can become people of Qur'an. Hudan lil nas. Open invitation to humanity. That eradicates racism, nationalism, tribalism, egotism. It gets rid of these things. SubhanAllah, what an amazing religion. This is such an incredible thing. Even in America, I can tell you, there are black churches, there are Spanish churches, there are Greek churches, even of the same denomination. And then in the, in the heart of Brooklyn, you're gonna have, in New York, in Brooklyn, you'll have different churches, different ethnicities. You walk into the masjid, it's an international conference again. All the same ethnicity standing together. They don't even speak each other's language, but they're praying together. The same Quran unifies us. Because when we stand in Salat, what are we listening to? Quran. Allah says, In fuqara, min You've chosen the right spouse. If the person is poor, Allah will bless them with his virtue because Allah is the one who owns sustenance. How many people have got their daughters married to wealthy people? Ten years down the line, they lost everything. So it's not to do with wealth, it's to do with the right person. 
And this is why the hadith says there are several things people look at. Some look at wealth, some look at looks. Your choice, yes, you must look at what the person looks like. Definitely, you have to live with them. At the end of the day, you have to be intimate with them. You're not going to go with those masks that they give out on Emirates and, and then, you know, be intimate with your spouse. No, you want to look at them. You want to see them. Yes, so you must be able to like your spouse. Definitely, but your decision must not be based solely on looks. There must be an overriding factor. What is it? It's not going to do only with the lineage. No, you can't marry them. They're not from our family. They're not from our tribe. They're not from our caste. They're not from this side. They're not exactly, you know, so and so. No. Are they Muslim? Are they decent people? Do they have character? Let it go. Allahu Akbar. Let it happen. Do not be a person from the pagan days of ignorance. You know, Bilal ibn Rabah and his brother, radiallahu anhuma, they got to the community and they said, we are whom you know we are. If you are going to allow us to marry your daughters, alhamdulillah. If not, Allah will provide. Wallahi, they looked. Bilal ibn Rabah, a man from Africa, subhanallah. A man whom the Prophet sallallahu said, I heard his footsteps in paradise. It shook the people. They immediately got them married. That shows us that it's got to do with the nobility of a person. Look at the status of a person. You know, I've heard of people say, no, this man is a little bit too dark for my daughter to get married to. Come on. You can be as dark as charcoal, but if your daughter is up in the air, Alhamdulillah, she's happy. She's excited. What's the point of marrying the most handsome man, the wealthiest man, and your daughter is crying every night and she's cursing you. My dad did something very bad. I'll never forgive him. When you die, you are receiving the sin of what happened. Allahu Akbar. Why should that happen? This is the reality of why knots are being broken today. We want to tie it correctly. Well, understand the hadith says, yes, you may look at what she looks like. You may want to look at her status, her lineage. You may want to look at everything. Those are not the deciding factors. The deciding factor is deen. deen. You want to be successful. You want victory. You want success in the dunya and the akhirah. Then succeed by marrying the one who has the consciousness of Allah in her or the consciousness of Allah in him. That is success. May Allah bless us all, really. And sometimes we ignore that the environment has actually affected our child. Listen carefully. Sometimes we ignore the fact that the environment has affected our child. So the child comes up with their own proposition and we get upset and angry. I don't want, you know what? Talk to your child, try and convince them, listen to their story, lend them an ear. You do not want them to do things behind your back. You are not Allah. Lend them an ear. My daughter, what happened? How do you know this guy? Don't just get angry. I will fix you up. I'm going to damage you. Be careful. No way. That's not how you talk to your daughter. Because tomorrow when she marries, what will happen? What example have you laid? You speak to her with respect. She is a human being. Before she belonged to you, she is and was Allah's, always Allah's. You will perhaps die leaving her behind to live for decades after you. She belongs to Allah. Inna lillahi. The Quran doesn't say inna li abaina. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We belong to Allah and unto Him is our return. The hadith didn't say we belong to our fathers and our forefathers and unto Him, unto them is our return. No. Yes, we may. We have to be kind. Allah chose our parents for us indeed. But remember one thing. You speak to your children. You listen to what they have to say. They will then tell you, you know, dad, I went to the varsity. And I saw a guy reading his salah all the time. And I saw this and I saw that. And for some reason, somehow I developed feelings for this young man. Please give him a chance. Talk to him. They say, okay, let me talk to him. I am not encouraging this type of behavior, but I'm saying it is happening. Face it. If you have not involved in the lives of your children a lot, then this type of thing will keep on happening. But those parents who've involved a lot, their children tell them a lot of what goes on in their lives. Alhamdulillah, they will be able to guide their children. You know, if your son says, hey, today we saw the uncle was smoking and he threw the stub on the floor and a few of us picked it up and we were checking it out. And you look at him and say, son, be careful. Watch out. That's not what is what's supposed to happen. Perhaps he will talk to you more and more. But if you tell him what and you lift him up and you pump him one, Wallahi, he's never going to talk to you again. He's never going to because he knows my dad is mad, man. <laughs> really, you tell him something, he'll, he'll destroy you completely. He's punched me in my, my, my belly and so on. Some of the countries people go and report their parents. 
May Allah forgive us. So, this is why we say, if the person, if your daughter has come up with something of this nature, perhaps you must listen to what they have to say. Meet the man, to talk to him. He might be better than all the options you've ever thought about. It doesn't mean that he, she has to marry the son of your business partner. No. Marriage is not a business deal in Islam. Not at all. People say, no, 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 no. I thought this son must marry. Those are the marriages. Sometimes they don't work because you know why? The girl was forced, you forced your daughter to marry someone whose father forced him to marry her. So they were both forced on either side. They sleep like a divorced couple from day one. What's happening? Whose fault is it? Both parents. Literally, silly people. People who didn't think. People who thought that, you know what? I can do. And, and this is me. And Allah has given me the right. It is haram, haram, haram. It is prohibited to force your daughter to marry someone. Totally prohibited. You cannot force. You can suggest. You can say, look, what about this? And what about that option? She has the right to say, I do not want. It's over. Did you hear that? She has the right. She is entitled to say, I do not want. And you have to surrender because she belongs to Allah before she came to you. Same applies to your sons. No forcing. And you know, a man is he who can say to the father of the girl that look, I'm being forced. Or the girl says, I'm being forced. Speak up. Don't come up 10 years down the line and say, I never wanted to marry you. I was forced by my dad. It's happening a lot. Don't do that. Say it in advance. That look, I have a problem. I'm not ready to marry. Please, they are forcing me to do this. You help me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. My brothers and sisters, it's a vast topic. If you notice, I have tried to tackle the problems of society. What we are facing across the globe in the Muslim Ummah. We have this crisis. People have not understood. I give you another example. Someone reverts to Islam. We get very happy, don't we? A person reverts to Islam. Mashallah, this guy from Germany has accepted Islam. Alhamdulillah. We are so excited because he became a Muslim. Do you know that they are finding it very difficult to get married because of our backwardness? No one's marrying because when it comes to marriage, no, no, no. But he is cleaner and purer than others who've committed sin and so on. In Islam, you look at him if he's dedicated and he's good and his his ideas are correct and his perhaps beliefs are within the line and so on. You you there is nothing wrong in offering him your daughter. Nothing wrong in Islam. It can happen either way. But no, he's a revert. He's Caucasian or revert. These people were Hindus before. Brother, your great grandfather was a Hindu as well. Allahu Akbar. What about that? These people were Buddhist. So what? They accepted Islam. We have a, a crisis in the Ummah. That is a huge crisis. So many people who've reverted to Islam, they are stronger than born Muslims. And we say, no, I won't want my daughter to marry here. We are not saying you need to shove it down anyone's throat. But what we are saying, if there is an interest and if the person is a candidate, let it be. So what? Nationality means nothing. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. The world is now a little global village. You know, people are in touch with each, with each other and they promise each other to marry. If you were, and I'm repeating it for the third time, if you were close enough to your child before they promised someone that they would marry them, they would have told you, they would have asked you, they would have involved you. But because you were too distant with your friends and your nightlife and what else and everything else, some people are too distant. Some people are so religious that it becomes sacrilegious. You know what that means? To serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is definitely something good. But to go beyond the limit to the degree that the other obligations on your shoulders, you have foregone them, you have left them. It's an obligation for you to do this and you have not done it in that particular case. What's the point of a man who goes to the masjid and spends the whole day in the masjid whilst his family are looking at other men in order to resolve their matters and to go and buy something for them and look after their needs. What's the point? So you need to strike a balance. Nobody is saying don't go to the masjid. You need to go. But you must know when you need to depart. When your family needs you, you need to talk to them. You need to meet them. You need to look after them. That's also a duty. It is farad as well. It is a duty obligation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make it easy for us all. 
اقرأ كتاب الله ترق جنانه وتنى العظيم الأجر والغفران رتله روي القلب من نفحاته كالماء يروي لهفة العطشان